Hey guys, Stealth here, and welcome to the Broken Arrow Open Beta. We're going to have a look at some of the Russian builds that you can go for when you're creating a battle group for this beta. If you want to play the beta yourself, link down below in the description. It is an open beta, so you can play it for free. It's going to last until about halfway February, so you should have some time to play. Now, you have a couple of different ways to set up this deck, this battle group. But, as you're building it, you can currently only choose two specializations. You can bring the VDV Brigade and the Guard Tank Brigade. And that's the only specializations that you'll have. When the game goes into full release, we'll have a lot more specializations. But for now, this is it. Now, in this video, I'm going to go over a couple of different ways that you can set up these decks. Sorry, battle groups. You got the airdrop, the balanced, and the motorized versions. These are not my own. These are the ones that the devs have sent me. Let's go over the airdrop version. Now, in case you're not familiar with Broken Arrow and some of its mechanics, you can airdrop units as well as supplies from both helicopters as well as the IL-76MD, the big cargo plane. So that's the core of this battle group, bringing things from the air. Now, let's have a look at the recon tab. What sort of units do we have here overall? We have Razvetka. These guys are mostly there to deal with various sorts of threats while they're giving you information on what the enemy has. You can see they're armed with a couple of assault rifles, they have an underbower grenade launcher, they have an RPG 7D3 capable of dealing with vehicles, and they have the SVDS, which is a longer range weapon. 600 meters, not sure I would quite call it a sniper, but it is definitely going to allow them to do some standoff warfare. These guys are currently, in this airdrop deck, brought in in the MI-8 AMT-SHVN. Um, <clears throat> this one you can set up with all sorts of weaponry by itself. You can go for, for example, middle pylons with gun pods to further boost the firepower of the Resvetka. Or give them, in this case, the Igla to deal with enemy helicopters. In case you really want to turn this thing into a gunship, you could. If you bring in gun pods, and let's say you give it attacker. It's going to make for a very expensive helicopter, though. It's 175 points, plus the 70 points that you're paying for the Resvetka. So, it's going to be a pretty expensive reconnaissance unit. But then again, you're not really just bringing the reconnaissance unit. You're bringing a reconnaissance unit plus a gunship. So, in that sense, you can basically distinguish these two as two separate units. Because, of course, the helicopter can bring in the troops, but doesn't have to stay with the troops. You can always use the helicopter somewhere else, or bring it back to base and just get some refunds on your points. Now, the Resvetka themselves have a couple of different loadouts. They have the loud version, or they have the suppressed version, which gives them a slightly different weapon. And you can see that the damage from the suppressed version goes, um, well, it goes up, actually, at least on the AK-103. They also got the SVUAS, which is another ranged weapon. When it comes to their ability to do stealth, it doesn't really change. Like, the stealth values don't really change that much, but if you're using suppressed weaponry, I imagine your squad, when it opens up, is going to have a bit more time before they get detected. Next, we have the VDV Snipery. Sniper units, as the name implies, and with these you have two different loadouts again. you got long-range rifles or the suppressed loadout. Now, most importantly, I'd say about the snipers is their very high stealth value, which means detecting these guys is going to be very difficult. They also have a laser designator. This is going to allow you to call in laser-guided strikes, such as ones from smart bombs from aircraft. Now, the base Razvetka don't... Sorry, they do have that too. So both the base Razvetka and the snipery have this laser designator. They also can be brought in various vehicles. In this case, the dev has decided on the Typhoon. But you can see that they have 3 out of 4 VDV Snipery, you also have 3 out of 4 VDV Typhoon Transports, but you don't have to use these. You can also say that you want to bring in the Snipery on the MI-8. Because as opposed to Wargame, as opposed to Warno, you're not marrying these two units together. You can bring in the Snipery on foot if you want to. You can bring them in in a transport helicopter that's not listed here if you have it in a helicopter tab. And you can even use it with the airdrop version from the big cargo plane. Now the snipery, I would use these as more passive spotters. These are the ones that are lying on the sides, maybe picking off high value targets if you see it. However, they don't really have any great capabilities against vehicles. Keep that in mind. 
these guys are much more capable as passive spotters. Whereas the Vidu Vira Zvetka, let's use these as more active spotters. Let them engage the enemy, especially if they get a high value target. Maybe um, anti air that you found, maybe some nice artillery unit that you've spotted. Use these and the rocket launcher to take it out. Next unit that we have is the VDV Spetsnaz. And these are potentially, depending on how you load them out, a bit of a specialist. They have either the Thermobaric Launcher, which makes them exceptionally good against enemy infantry, or you can give them a Metis HGM. Now, if you give them a Metis, their role changes dramatically, because all of a sudden they're not there to kick down the doors and to eliminate enemy infantry, but they're much more capable of holding their ground against vehicles. That's what the Metis is for. This is going to give you some choices. How do you want to play these guys? In this case, I would want to have the Rezvetka as active spotters, Snipery as passive spotters, and the VDV... Well, personally, I would probably give them the Metis and maybe keep that weapon turned off up until such a time when I find a very high value target. As for the transport options, let's go over these. We have quite a few different options, and uh, depending on how much you want to spend, well, you could spend a lot on these categories. We got the BMD 2M, and I'm going to compare this to the BMD 4, because they're pretty similar. But the BMD 4, slightly more expensive, slightly heavily armored. And again, you can change the armor package on the BMD 4 to give it up armor and make it even tougher. Now, as for the BMD 2, you can set a different weapon package with this. So if you currently look at the BMD 2, it has a weapon launcher, uh, sorry, a missile launcher attached to it, the Cornet HGM. If you decide that you really don't want to spend additional 20 points here, you can just say, well, nope, I'm not going to go with the HGM. Um, I think just an autocannon and a machine gun is enough for what I have in mind with these guys. Considering that these Spetsnaz are going to be pretty aggressive, in the sense that with their current loadout, they might take down enemy infantry, I think using the autocannon and the HGM is a pretty good idea. Because with this, they'll be able to deal damage against tanks, potentially, depending on whether the tanks have active protection systems, provide autocannon support with the infantry, and potentially do some damage against um, lighter vehicles that are coming in with the infantry. So let's say there's a bunch of Humvees rolling around. Your BMD-4 is going to be able, or sorry, the BMD-2 in this case, is going to be able to take those things down. As for the Typhoon, that's your basic truck. It is not that special. It is, however, a bit faster. This thing has a road speed of 100. These tracked vehicles are only doing 70 or 80. So if you want to get there quick, you can. And you can even give these guys an autocannon. But keep in mind, the autocannon is going to be providing fire support, uh, but the fire support vehicle itself is not as heavily armored as those BMDs. The helicopter I've covered. we got the BTRD if you want something real cheap. It's only going to cost you 45 points. And it is more heavily armored and sits basically somewhere between these three vehicles. And the weapon package is either a couple of machine guns or a heavy machine gun and a grenade launcher. Which would make them far more valuable in a fire support role against enemy infantry. Other reconnaissance options that we have are this one. The 1v119 Rheostat. It looks like it might have an HGM launcher on it, but it is just an optics package. That's all that it has. These guys, much like their other recon counterparts, have a laser designator, so you can call in laser guided strikes. You don't call in the laser guided strike with the vehicle, you just use the laser on the vehicle to mark a target. And then you bring in a different unit that can actually capitalize on that laser designation. Now the rheostat um, is very thin skinned, everywhere. 30, 30, 20, 20, it's just very, very weak. Keep this guy a bit farther back if you can, because if you put this guy out to the front, it is defenseless, it doesn't have any weapons, and it is very easy to kill. As for the BRM-3K57, the 57 indicates the 57mm gun attached to the vehicle. And as opposed to the rheostat, this one can very much defend itself. It also has quite a lot of protection, and that has to do with the ERA upgrade that this vehicle has received. The base, BRM-3, is not that heavily armored. So if you are taking this thing into a fight, I would definitely recommend bringing the ERA package. As for their weapons package, you got some options. You can bring the 2A72 autocannon, but you're sacrificing your ATGM. You can upgrade to a single 57 or 57 plus ATGM launcher, and that's the attacker missile, 
that does a lot of damage, allowing the BRM-3K to punch way above its weight class as it takes down potentially down enemy armor. What you do note is that this guy does not have a laser designator. You can get that if you want to. But if this thing gets turned into a laser designator, the only thing you'll have is a heavy machine gun. So all of a sudden, this is basically a very heavily armored laser designator. Which, it might make sense, depending on how you're going to play this unit. It might make sense. As for the way that it's currently set up in this deck, I think the 57 variant with the attacker makes more sense. Now, then we have the Sarmat, lightly armored, uh, very poorly armored vehicle. Comes with a couple of upgrades, and much like the American counterpart, you can put an HGM onto this. And suddenly, this becomes a very mobile tank hunter, because these things do 130. That is a lot of speed. You can use these in their HGM, let's say, tank hunter role. You can give them a minigun, you can give them a grenade launcher, or just a heavy machine gun. Now, in their, let's say, their base roll with 40 points uh, with a, an HMG, you can just use these as cheap, fast, throwaway reconnaissance units. You don't have to pay a lot for them. If they die, well, it's just 40 points, whatever. And if you want to give them more teeth, it's really only 15 points. Again, allowing them to punch way above their weight class. However, the Metis HGM is outdated, I'd say. Especially considering that some tanks have a lot of accuracy and better range than this HGM. So keep that in mind. If you want to go with a very heavily armored platform to do some scouting, you got the T90M. This one, again, can get several upgrades. It currently has the PKT machine gun. If you want to do a bit more anti-infantry warfare, you can give it the cord, which gives it more punch. As for the optics, right now it only has base optics, but you can give it an optics mast. You can see that the optics stat here, the recon stat, it changes from 1700 to 2000. So for 30 points, you're making this thing a better reconnaissance platform. Something that the Americans, at least in the open beta version right now, don't seem to have are drones. The Russians do. Now these drones, you can send them in, just completely unarmed and use them as uh, cheap and relatively fast reconnaissance vehicles with a laser designator. So you can just use them as eyes in the sky and use another platform to do the actual killing. Or you can arm them, at least the forepost, with a couple of HGMs. This is going to allow them with their coronets to deal a lot of damage against enemy armor. Keep in mind these are, let's say, direct missiles, they're not top attackers, so you're going to go through 1000 millimeters of heat protection. Which I believe should put you, well, maybe some of the heaviest tanks are going to be capable of defeating this, especially if they have an active protection system, but the rest of them should be fair game. The Orion is their bigger drone. More pylons, more expensive and a lot more options. It base comes with a laser designator. If you want to give it better optics, you can, and the, the optics range goes to 2400. Inner pylons, well, we got a nice buffet of weaponry here. Currently they're empty. We can give them Coronet HGMs. You can even give them the Vicar HGMs. Oh, sorry, the, the, huh. Oh, this one does slightly more damage. The Coronet does slightly more damage and has slightly better pen. Their accuracy is spectacular overall. I'm not sure exactly why the Vickers would be more expensive. Oh, they got slightly more range. That's probably it. 1800 meters versus 1600 meters. Alternatively, you can also give it a low drag bomb. Now, why would you do this? Well, this thing can laser designate. And this is a laser guided bomb. So, in this case, the Orion can designate for itself... You can have your own laser, spotting a target, lasing a target, and then the low drag bomb comes out and the Cav-50 blows a fairly sizable hole into the enemy target. It is not that damaging, but it does have 30 millimeters of heat pen. So you can definitely cause some damage with it. Outer pylons, same loadout. So you can give it four bombs, you can give it four missiles of different types, depending on what you prefer. As for infantry, <clears throat> this is where the Russians have quite a lot of options. Let's go over them pretty quick. We've got the AGS-40. Uh, try not to look too much into how these gentlemen are carrying the grenade launchers, because I think that's a placeholder. These are fire support units. Nice to have grenade launchers. 
Very useful to kill enemy infantry. Not that good at dealing with enemy vehicles. You might be able to kill a Humvee. When it comes to dealing with anything that has more armor than that, good luck. Gvardi Motostrelki. Single loadout, you got no choices here. They're your basic infantry. They got some assault rifles, they got a lot of uh, RPGs. And with that, they'll be able to ambush armor. Now that's a lot of armor pen. 1000 millimeters with heat, yeah, that'll definitely leave a mark on the enemy target. Also a couple of machine guns, also a couple of underslung grenade launchers. You have options with the Guardi. Ingenieri, um, these guys are more your door kickers. They're going to go in when enemy infantry is inside of a building and you would like to see them leave that building one way or another. You got the AK-74M, you got an RPG, an underslung grenade launcher and the KSK, which is a shotgun. Very useful at dealing very quickly with enemy infantry. Verba, anti-air infantry, not much more special than that. They got the Verba, AG, uh, sorry, the Verba AA missile, surface to air missile, uh, so not an AA missile, I'm sorry. These guys, capable of dealing with helicopters and aircraft up to 2100 meters. Range, that is, not altitude. And um, <clears throat> just make sure that you have at least some of these in order to deal with enemy flying threats. VDV AGS-30, slightly different. Let's compare these to the base AGS-40. The AGS-40 versus the 30. Let me change the stat cards. If you look at the damage, it is similar. The suppression, oh, sorry, the damage, uh, I'm looking at it wrong. This is pen, so the pen is the same. The damage for the AGS-40 is better. The range of engagement is the same. I'd say this thing has a bit more punch, but the guys of the VDV AGS have a bit more health because they got five guys. So the squad might be more survivable, and this could matter in a situation where you're able to get just the last guy out, resupply him, and he's going back into the fight. Whereas if the AGS-40 squad dies, you're going to have to bring in a whole new squad to hold that position again. Next up. Uh, let's see, we had the AGS-30. The VDV DSH. Base VDV Infantry. No specific loadouts. Generalists. Very good at dealing with enemy armor, thanks to that same RPG. Oh, sorry, not the same RPG. The Guardi have better RPGs. The RPG-28. And this one is not as good. But it still packs an okay punch, especially if you're trying to attack armor from the side or even the rear. That'd be great. As for the rest, we have the Igla. Igla is slightly different again from the Verba. The Verba is a designated anti-air team. It only has a couple of assault rifles and some Verba. The VDV Igla not only carries the Igla D, which if you compare it to the Verba... I'd say it's very similar, except you're getting a bit less damage. You're getting a bit less pen. Beyond that, these guys can hold their own in a fight a bit longer. They have a machine gun with them, the PKP M. Again, there are five man squad versus four. So in that sense, again, just slightly better longevity. VDV Coronet and VDV Metis, I'm gonna be comparing these side by side again because they're pretty similar. They're both HGM teams. Um, when it comes to these guys, they are quite similar, but the Coronet has more missiles with them. These guys carry six missiles, the Metis team only carries three. You can, however, with the Coronet, change their loadout and turn it into a Coronet M. You turn it into a Coronet M, the stats change slightly, and you get 1200 millimeters of heat. That is a ton of damage. That's a ton of pen. You can get a lot of things penned with this. Of course, you got the enemy arc protection system that might cause some interference there. Now, vehicles wise, there are a couple of vehicles that you might have already seen, like the BTRD, the BMD2, the BMD4, the helicopter. You also got the BTR uh, MDM Rakushka, currently armed with just a machine gun, but you can turn this into, let's say, a semi anti air platform. The 23-2M can be used against helicopters, but it can also be used to mow down enemy infantry. And considering that they get a good rate of fire, this is going to cause enemy infantry a lot of grief. The Igla is going to allow you to deal with enemy helicopters. And planes, of course, but well. Iglas against planes. Um, with the range that planes have on their weapons, I generally don't see planes getting to range that much. 
Alternatively, we've got the uh, just the 23 2Ms or the 23 2, which is slightly inferior, or just the basic version. What else do we have in here? The BTR RD robot, capable of bringing the HGM, the Cornet or the Cornet M. So again, it's the slightly better version. But where it gets really interesting is with the Kurganets and the T15 Barbaris. Or Barbaris, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. The Kurganets is a very heavily armored platform, but not nearly as much as the Barbaris, because this is based on the T15 or T14 Armata chassis. So if you look at the amount of armor that this thing has, it is way, way more capable of letting these things take a fight with a tank. They won't strictly win it, but they'll be able to take a hit and probably survive and then take another hit and probably survive again. At some point, however, you're going to have to disengage because unless you are able to manage to get a couple of hits with the Cornet, you probably won't be able to kill the target. Now, of course, all this protection comes at a steep, steep price. These things are going for 250 and that is with the upgraded package. Um, you can also change the loadouts to have a 57mm versus a 30mm. Now, if you contrast these two, you can see that this has the heat rounds. This one also has heat rounds, but um, these do 30mm heat. These do 60mm heat. So your pen doubles. Your rate of fire is going to be less. Your suppressive effect, probably pretty similar. I think using this one should be good enough. The boomerang is going to allow you to do close fire support for infantry. And the cornet is going to allow you to kill enemy vehicles. Or at least make them reconsider whether they really want to fight you. Now the Kurganets is a lot cheaper. Um, it, however, has an option to go with the Epoca. The Epoca is another 57mm weapon. You get the Cornet and you get the Bulat. So the... Let me get the Kurganets on screen. This thing comes ton, <laughs> comes equipped with a ton of weaponry now. If you just go with the Boomerang, it does not have the, uh, the Bulat. Now this one... What can I say? Um, <laughs> it's 8 rockets and it is going to give tanks, again, a reconsideration about their life choices. Because this is 300mm heat. It, however, can also target infantry. So with this, you'll be able to engage both infantry and vehicles alike. I think against a tank that has any kind of modicum of armor, you probably won't be able to kill that. But most vehicles from the side, maybe the rear, you can. However, getting there, that might be the problem. Now, when it comes to protection, you can get an Afghanit APS on this, which is going to allow you to deal with enemy missiles quite easily. You get four charges, and it can extend your life, but I would expect this to be on the Kurganets, oh, sorry, on the Barbaris, a bit more than the Kurganets, because this is going to not survive a round from a tank anyway. So why would you really want to have that Afghanit, that APS, that active protection system? I think, as it is... Um, it's a heck of a fire support unit, but I would not send it out there with the infantry alone. I would make sure that it has a tank that protects it, and this thing defeats enemy infantry. If you want something a bit faster, you get the boomerang. This is doing a 100 mobility. The uh, Barbaris is doing 80, and the other one's also doing 80. So if you want to get there fast, you bring the boomerang, a nice wheeled vehicle. Protection-wise, far less, of course, because you can only attach so much armor when you only got wheels. Weaponry, the boomerang, and with the defense package, you can get up armor and you can get the Afghanit. So again, the active protection system. And all of a sudden, this becomes a very mobile, decently armored anti-missile system with a gun and an AGGM. So the boomerang suddenly gets a lot of teeth, but you're paying for it. 135 points, whereas the base variant is 50. So... Keep in mind that it might be nice to have those, but it's expensive. Right, I think that concludes all the vehicles that we have in the infantry tab. As for the infantry loadout, as you, uh, they have it here, you can see it's airdrop, which means that you might not even need all the vehicles in the infantry tab. Um, you can just drop the Verba with a helicopter. Um, you can put two or three Verba teams into one boomerang, because these guys only carry or require four seats the boomerang has eight, so you can bring two of these squads in one of them. As for the Barbaris, it also has eight seats. The boomerang has eight. The BTRD has ten. Looks uncomfortable, but <laughs> if you can squeeze ten guys in here, 
by all means, let's have a go. Um, Vehicle-wise, this is where you find the vehicles and the tanks. We have a fire support-ish slash light tank, the Sprut SD. This is the modernized version of the Sprut. You also got the base Sprut. Now, when it comes to their firepower, um, this one has, let's say... Uh, yeah, go to this stat. Unfortunately, I cannot change or I cannot show you these side by side, so we're gonna have to switch back and forth a bit. The dispersion on the base Sprut is a bit worse than the Sprut as the M. Um, mostly, you're looking at the amount of punch that these things have. You're going from 375 to 425, and you're getting twice the amount of rounds for the PKA. Uh, sorry, the PKT, the machine gun. Beyond that. Not much. Stats are very, very, very similar. It's just slightly more accurate. Since the vehicle itself doesn't really get any more upgrades, I think it might not be that worth it. It could, however, be worth it if you find that you run out of machine gun ammo a lot and you use this as a very good fire support vehicle for infantry. But then again, you already have quite a few options. Uh, we have the... I'm going to go by this line first. We have the Cornet D1, HGM carrier, and that's all that it does. It has currently 2 times 4 cornets. You can also give it 2 plus 2 cornets and better optics, which might allow it to spot for itself, depending on the size of the target. Keep in mind, thin-skinned, no machine gun. Enemy infantry can just walk up to this thing and send an RPG into it and kill it like that. It has absolutely no protection beyond running away. Sprut SD we've covered. We have the T-14 Armata. Now this is probably going to be a vehicle that some of you might go, yeah, <laughs> fantasy tank. Maybe. Um, it's in Broken Arrow, so you're going to have to deal with it in Broken Arrow. It has a lot of protection. 850mm kinetic, 1400 against heat rounds. It has a lot of punch all by itself. Although, as you can see, it is going to suffer a little bit when trying to deal with either H sorry, with either with heat protection or with kinetic protection. This thing cannot pen itself from the front. Unless you get closer. Closer range, um, at least in Wargame, and I suspect it's much the same here. The closer you get, the more your pen value goes up. But that works both ways. Your armor will not be as effective at short range. It comes with the active protection system. It comes with a couple of smoke charges. It has a cord heavy machine gun as a PKT. This thing is, uh, well, it looks very menacing. When it encounters an Abrams, I'm not sure who's going to win. Especially the, the super high-end Abrams. The T90M Arena. Currently with the Arena APS, but you can also just bring the base version. And then you got the base T90M. The Arena APS and the Arena APS and ERA, Explosive Reactive Armor, make this thing almost on par with the T90... Sorry, with the, the Armata. If you compare these side by side, you can see that the armor values are very similar. And even the T90M wins out with the better side armor relative to the one on the Armata. It has the same APS. It has the same smoke charges. Where does it differ then? Well, the gun. The gun on the Armada is just slightly better. You got 500 mm kinetic versus 450. Um, the heat round on the arena, however, is better. 850 versus 600. Which means that this thing will be able to pen its own size easily. The uh, Armada will not. As for the rest of the options that you get with this particular tank, you get the option to go with the cord or just the PKT. I think the cord is worth it, because it is another very hefty firepower weapon against infantry. And, well, infantry could be the biggest threat to this tank. Not so much HGM infantry, because you got that nice protection system. Although, with four charges run and done, uh, you might start taking hits. If you keep this thing resupplied, maybe shorter range infantry, like the direct RPGs, are going to be a bit more of a problem. So in that case, I think the cord is well worth it. Whether the armor protections or the armor upgrades are worth it, uh, that's entirely up to you. It might be true. It might not. If you use these things as, let's say, simple T90Ms, or, well, simple-ish T90Ms, in the form of direct fire support for infantry, just additional guns, you might not need all the fancy armor. 
But if you're going to use these instead of the T-14 as your heavy hitter, as your frontline tank, in that case, yeah, it might be worth it. The T-80UM has a couple of different upgrades as well. You got the standard T-90, uh, sorry, T-80 uh, 1990s version, as well as a one with a jammer. Now, it does not just get a jammer. You're also getting better armor. It goes from 650 to 700, but more importantly, you get electronic countermeasures. 20%, so it's not like you'll have an instant I win button against any kind of missile. The jammer, the electronic countermeasures don't run out, as opposed to the armata. So in that sense, it is a bit more durable. But it's not a hard kill on a missile that the armata and, for example, the arena can do. You can get an APS on the T-80, and you only get two charges. So yeah, you can get it, but it's a bit more limited. And the T-80UM Plus has better optics. Now this starts at the UM or the UA. Uh, the base UM2 does not have it. It's got 1,200. The base has 1,200. These guys have 1,400. Uh, what else do we have? We got the T90. It's not the T90M Arena, but the other one. And over here we got a version from 92 or 2006, which, again, changes the accuracy as it changes the gun. You get a bit more punch. You get a lot more armor. And that, including ECM, makes this a pretty solid tank. Now, the only ones I have not had yet are the Sturm. Sturm S, again, an HGM carrier. Right now, carrying the Sturm S. Uh, you can also give it the Sturm SM, which gives it the Attacker missile. Now, this one gets you slightly better range. The Sturm SM, that is. You still keep the 12 missiles, but you get more pen and you get more damage. You're going from 10 damage to 11, and supposedly, they have 100% accuracy. Last, but definitely not least, the BMPT Terminator. Um, this thing, based on the chassis of a tank, and with different types of weapons available, as well as different types of armor available. You're currently looking at the base version. This one has base armor and just, let's say, the base weaponry, which is no slouch. It has attack HGMs, it has the 2A42 autocannons, the double ones at that. If you want more infantry, infantry warfare, uh, more infantry killing power, you bring grenade launchers on it. This is just murderous against infantry. If you also want to be a bit safer as you're moving around cities where the infantry might be hiding, you bring the additional ERA, which means that the sides are going from eight, sorry, from 600 to 800. The front, however, does not change. So this is something that only protects the sides of the vehicle. What else do we have? Supply and support. We have a couple of supply trucks, both of which have um, an okay amount of supplies, depending on how the conflict goes. The VDV Kamas has 3,000 points of supplies. Uh, this one can carry 15,000. So in this one, you can carry a lot if you're expecting to build, let's say, a temporary fob at the front line. I'd say the Kamas VDV is for smaller engagements or if you just need a cheap transport to get a couple of logistics deployed quickly and fairly cheaply. This one can get some protection, but, well, it's still just a truck. It's not going to really survive a whole lot. That's your logistics options. We have the... Let's go with the, the list over here. The Tunguska M. Nice NTR platform. Uh, fairly pricey at 200 points. And that's the Tunguska M version. If you want to get the Tunguska M1, you're going to be playing 25 points more. And the Panzer is 75 points more. It gets expensive. Now, the Tunguska M has 2200 meter range missiles, 130 HE power, oh, sorry, heat power, and 13 damage. The Panzer has more killing power, it has better range, and it has more damage. That is potentially a very deadly combination. But you're paying the price. Do you really want to pay almost 300 points for an NTR platform? Again, I'd say the answer is going to be well, it varies. If the enemy is using a lot of helicopters, this could be a very cost-effective weapon to shut it down. If you're just dealing with like one, well, let's say one Cobra, uh, maybe a Viper that happens to be harassing your forces, then this might be a very expensive way of fixing your front line. And maybe infantry with an Igla can do the same thing. Uh, over here we have the 2S31 Vena. 
This one deals with enemy flying units. Oh, sorry, no, it's a mortar. <laughs> My bad. Uh, firing a 120mm gun at flying targets, I suppose, could work. But uh, this one's a mortar. Carrying 40 HE rounds, 21 smoke rounds, and a couple of heat rounds. Nice to have. These heat rounds can deal with vehicles and infantry. So they can deal with both. The smoke rounds, nice to cover up your forces, either in retreating or uh, offensive maneuvers. And if you want to, you can also give it HE wrap. The difference is that you get a laser guided shell, but you only get nine of them. So again, if you have the sniper reconnaissance deployed and they laser a target, this thing is going to be able to get very good dispersion on target versus this one, which is not going to be as good. The HE wrap. Let's see what the changes are. This thing does 60 millimeters heat pen. Uh, I suspect this one does the same. Yeah. When it comes to the blast radius, the blast radius is the same. Suppressive power. I am not really sure what's the difference here. Maybe I'm missing something. Supply cost is the same. Damage is nine. Damage is nine. Range. Ah, range. 2400 meter range. And this is 2100 meter range. So you're getting 300 meters. Could be the difference between being able to get into range or not. And otherwise, drive up a little bit. Need something bigger? We got the Coalitia SV for you. Currently packing high explosive rounds. 152 millimeter with 4200 meter range. Definitely a lot more. Can also fire smoke. Cannot fire heat. Yet. But if you want to give it cluster ammo and... I am eager to test this thing out against all the Abrams that are going to be running rampant on the battlefield. This is going to give you cluster ammunition. This could very well be an answer to dealing with tanks, and it is a top attack weapon, and it drops these little cluster bomblets, which can damage tanks from above. APS, active protection systems, don't cover that area. They do not cover against cluster. So this could be a very good way to deal with enemy armor, but keep in mind, the enemy armor might not stay mobile, or sorry, might not stay uh, stationary. So you're going to have to get these shells there pretty quick. They're not laser guided. So you're, well, you're going to hope that they hit. Extended range not only gives you the HE shells back, but also gives you 4500 meter range as opposed to 4200. And this does give you a laser guided shell. You get 12 of those, and their dispersion is a lot less. It's 160 to 120 versus 100, uh, 240 versus 180. So you're going to be a lot more accurate. And 75 millimeter heat. This one, I'd say, is a bit more versatile than just the cluster rounds. This one is a sheer vehicle killer. This one gives you the ability to go after vehicles, potentially even heavy armor with the laser guided shell. And the rest of the HE is just there to deal with, well, whatever happens to be in the area. The 2S41 Drog. Basically, uh, a small mortar with an 82mm mortar that is uh, mounted on a vehicle. You get the mostly HE or mostly smoke. So this is a smoke layer HE bomber. It does change pretty dramatically. So be very sure which one you want to bring. Because 12 smoke shells might not be enough to lay a smoke screen. Uh, 24 should be plenty. And 16 HE shells. Well, if you want to use these things in a fire support role, you're going to have to make choices. Because the HE variant would be great, but once you've deployed your fire support, then you might want to smoke so your forces can move in, but you don't have enough smoke. I think the mostly smoke might be a slightly better option, because I tend to use mortars mostly for smoke. 2 uh, S9 Nona. Again, another mortar system, 120 millimeters, 120 millimeters, and the SM version comes again with that laser-guided shell. You also get the slightly better range with the Nona SM. The Grad. Capable of going with all sorts of loadouts. High explosive, cluster, or even incendiary. This would be lovely if you have a building that you would like to see vacated, but your occupants are refusing to leave. So in that case, you just sent them the good news with a group of incendiary rockets. Got armor, bring the cluster, uh, one more versatility, a high explosive. Anti-air, the book M3. Very capable anti-air missile system. You got 3200 meter range, should be plenty to deal with most planes. 
With a radar, this thing becomes a bit more uh, capable. But if you are using a radar, keep in mind, it will also be able to get picked up by counter radar units. Seed. Suppression of enemy air defense. These will target this if you have your radar on. Now this is the Book M3. You also got the Book M2. The Book M2, if you look at the differences, you're getting slightly less range. Uh, the blast radius on the M2, however, is bigger. It's 132 versus 52. Why would this be, di why would this be important? Um, it could be that there is, let's say, more than one aircraft that is currently flying over an area. If you hit it with an M2, that might be more useful. It might do a bit more. It is, however, a slower missile. It has a max speed of 700. This has a speed of 800. And with that, it is slightly faster. Less blast radius, but, well, I'd like to catch the target in the first place. Derivatia. Anti-air autocannon. There's not a whole lot more about it than that. You also get the option to not use the autocannon, the 2S90, oh, sorry, the 2A90, and instead launch a couple of Sosnum missiles. These are capable of not only dealing with aircraft, uh, but also helicopters, as opposed to the book. And they can target ballistic missiles. If you happen to catch them, they can target ballistic missiles. They're not radar guided, and as such, cannot be picked up by counter radar weapons. Logistics we've covered. We got the Strela 10. Two different loadouts. Sorry, three different loadouts. Strela 10, the Luchnik E which is uh, basically an Iglo rack, or the Sosna, as discussed previous. Now, Luchnik versus the Strela. Blast radius slightly worse. Maximum speed is better on the Strela. So, why would you want these? Well, you get slightly more of them. You get 16 as opposed to 12. I think I prefer the Strela over the Luchnik. As for the, the Sosna, yeah, definitely an upgrade over the Strela, but... Uh, gets expensive. Want something really, <laughs> really dead that happens to be airborne? S-300. You got a couple of different options. You can either bring four gladiator missiles or you can bring two giant missiles. Now, these missiles both have a range of 800, uh, sorry, a maximum speed of 800. Their range for the giant missiles is better. Four and a half kilometers. The blast radius, 150. The blast radius here, slightly less, but considering the size of these missiles, it's relatively small that you're sacrificing this level of damage. They are radar guided. They can use, I think they can be used without a radar, but if they have a radar, they're going to be more effective. Lastly, the TOR. That's the last NTR unit. And as you can see, it still has the vertically launched missiles, which I really like. I think it's a nice platform to have. It is capable of dealing with helicopters, ballistic missiles, and planes. So you got different options there. If you compast, uh, contrast and compare this to, for example, the Sosna, it's pretty similar, isn't it? It's pretty similar, but there are some dif some differences. Um, you got target types, helicopter, aircraft, projectile. Over here, you got the same thing, but it seems not to have been added to this, let's say, list. It just says target types 184. Or maybe 1, 8, and 4. I'm not sure how the, the game reads that. Range on the tour is slightly less. Accuracy is spectacular. Damage, however, is in favor of the tour. You do more damage with it. Suppressive power, 144 versus 470. Now, suppression is going to allow a unit to get panicked. So, a panicked unit is not going to be as effective. Um, if you get hit by something that has a higher suppressive value, it is more likely to start panicking you. All these missiles, however, are cheaper. 85 points versus 100. And last, the TOS-1. Couple of different options with this guy. You got the TOS-1 or the TOS-1A. They're both thermobaric weapons. The range, however, for the TOS-1A is slightly better. As for the rest, dispersion is a bit higher, probably because of that bigger range. And beyond that, well, supply cost goes up a little bit. Armor package, you can equip this thing with contact armor, making it more survivable. Because these are fairly short range artillery systems, so they might at some point get shot at. Which means that you don't want to lose your 250 point investment, and for just 10% extra, it's going to be a bit more survivable. Helicopter tab next. 
we have a couple of different mixes and matches over here. It's gunships and it's transport helicopters, and some can be both. The KA-52 is a Swiss Army knife. This thing can have tons and tons and tons of different loadouts. And what you want is very much up to you. You can turn this thing into, let's say, a pretty cheap gunship. Right now, it just carries a couple of rocket pods and an autocannon. You can also just say, well, I want more guns. More guns, more better. So it has the autocannon and it has gun pods. The middle pylons can have rocket pods. The big ones, that is the S13s, you can give them smaller rocket pods, you can give them HGMs, you can give them the Vickers, which are better HGMs. The outer pylons can only have the Igla anti-air missile. So with this, your helicopter is going to be able to shoot down other helicopters and, well, I guess in a pinch, a plane, if it comes to that. I'm going to move on to the Mi-28N, because it's another combat weapon or combat helicopter as opposed to the Mi-26. Lots of options here, but not quite the same as the KA-52. The KA-52 has 2400 meters spotting, and that makes it a very good spotter. Almost a reconnaissance unit, really. The M-28N does not quite have that, but it can be. You can add it a radar, and with this you're going up to that 2400 meter range, but let's say the base KA-52 already gets that to some extent. Outer pylons, rocket pods of different types and varieties, but this thing can carry eight Iglas. This thing can be an anti-air helicopter. The inner pylons, however, cannot add more Iglas, although I think eight should be enough. You can have the big rocket pods or the small ones. The MI-28NM gets the radar by default. It gets that better optics. And if you look at the inner pylons, you can get the HE rocket pods, the S-13 and the S-8, but also the Elmer. Now, what is that? It's a laser-guided missile. Or at least... <laughs> it looks to be a laser-guided missile. But I'm not so sure if it is. Because it doesn't have that icon yet. Although that could be, let's say, work in progress. It can deal with infantry and vehicles. And Guinness Vehicles is going to do 100 millimeters. Should be sufficient, you'd think. Whether it will actually work like that... Not too sure. I mean, the side of a tank is not really going to give when it gets hit by this. As for the outer pylons, you can have a mix of Vickers and Iglas, allowing this thing a lot of versatility. Dealing with infantry with the autocannon, dealing with vehicles, dealing with uh, tanks, dealing with helicopters. It can get turned into your, let's say, super all-round gunship. But it gets expensive. This is 340 points for one helicopter. So you're pretty much on par with the tanks at this point. The Mi-8 um, is mostly a supply vehicle, but it can have some offensive options. You can give it rocket pods, the gun pods, the S-8 pods, or both. You can give it a mix. Keep in mind, this can be bringing supplies, but it can also bring in 21 guys. So you could deploy, let's say, all of your anti-air teams in one helicopter. I'm not sure why you would want to. But you could, considering the amount of seats that you have. MI-26, just a huge logistics helicopter. That's all it can do. It can seat 85 guys. It can also bring 20,000 points to the front line. And I believe with this, it can probably also carry some vehicles. But that feature, I don't believe, is going to be in the open beta. MI-35N, uh, let's say a bit more of an affordable gunship, depending on how you load it out. It comes with the autocannon, the GS-23L. When you look at the inner pylons, we got the rocket pods, but also the gun pods. You can get the port side with the Igla, the Iglas, the rocket pods, starboard, attackers. So this thing doesn't get, or it doesn't mix and match the, the inner pods and the outer pods. It just matches, oh sorry, it matches the inner pods, but also one on the port, one on the starboard. So one on the left, one on the right. It also can have the uh, protection system, which gives it 10% ECM. Could be nice to deal with enemy missiles. It is not an active protection system. It does not kill the missile. It just distracts the missile a bit. Finally, air. We got the very, very big cargo plane. Um, as opposed to the Americans, this one is unarmed. Well, sorry, it cannot be armed, but it has some level of firepower. 
It can seat 125 guys, so you can drop a lot of things and people from this plane. You can also bring in a lot of supplies. Keep in mind, it turns like a brick. This thing is just one big cargo plane and it will need escorts, or you're going to have to really be sure that the enemy has no anti-air around. SU-25T, ground support aircraft, and you get so many options with this thing. You get so many options. You can give it a better radar to allow it to do tons of spotting. On the wingtips, you can have air-to-air -air missiles. You can have more air-to-air -air missiles. You can have ECM pods to deal with enemy radar systems. You can have R-73 if you want to do more against, let's say, helicopters. The outer pylons, you can give it longer range missiles. You can give it shorter range missiles. You can give it rockets. You can give it a smaller rocket pods, you can give it even smaller rocket pods or smart bombs. The smart bombs more effective against, um, I'd say, vehicles because they are top attacking. With that, quite deadly indeed. Middle pylons, mostly the same options except for the AGM, the air-to-ground missile. Uh, it is a top attacker and with the... Am I looking at the right one? Here. Uh, this... Same here, by the way. This is a low drag bomb. I was comparing the wrong one. Low drag bomb, laser guided. That's the one I just had on the outer pylons. These things can get used with a laser guided weapon. And this thing can laser for itself. So you can get a very, very, very accurate bomb over here with 20 meter dispersion. So basically right through the window of the target. The KH-25ML laser guided missile as well does a lot against vehicles. Very useful to kill tanks. Inner pylons, you can get the same types of loadout, but you can also get a seed missile. Or you can get fuel tanks to keep this thing around for longer. Now if you go with a seed missile, this thing can basically engage everything that happens to be on the ground. You can do gun pod runs, uh, you can deal with aircraft, or sorry, with radar, uh, you can deal with tanks, you can deal with tanks even more with the KH-25, which arguably could be a bit redundant. So let's say, let's give it long range air to air missiles. Uh, there they are, 71. We can give smart bombs and we have short range missiles. So this thing can deal with everything that happens to be around. S-30SM fighter or well it can be if you wanted to lots of options including a 1500 kilogram laser guided bomb this thing leaves a lot more of an impression on the enemy than the relatively smaller bombs that you've seen on the su-25 this is uh here it is this is the 500 kilogram bomb so this thing is three times that it also comes at least in the current variant with just a ton of anti-tank uh, missiles, the AGMs. So it could be a phenomenal tank killer. The only thing it right now does not have yet is a laser-guided system. It cannot, unfortunately, designate for itself as opposed to the SG-25T. ECM pods, however, might be useful to keep it around for longer and you can give it ECM pods and some air-to-air -air weaponry if you're expecting to also have to go up against aircraft. SG-34... Um, this one, again, very, very multi-role. It can do a lot of different things for you. It's a, but, a bit more of a bomber, however. It focuses more on, let's say, cargo delivery. Not the kind of cargo that the IL-76 does, but cargo nonetheless. Incendiary bombs, cluster bombs, thermobaric bombs, carpet bombs, <laughs> smart bombs, bigger smart bombs, air-to-ground missiles, or just your standard uh, slowed-down bomb, hydrag bombs. So these slow down a bit more. Um, I'm honestly not too sure what the advantage of that is. Inner pylons, pretty much the same loadout, but also the anti-radiation missile. So dealing with enemy radar. And you can even scroll up. This thing can get cruise missiles. These things have a range of 4,000 meters. They can hit targets from the top, deal with that level of armor. And I think, yeah, they're clusters. So they're cluster missiles. Yeah, I gotta test these things out at some point. SU-35, this is your fighter. It has fuel tanks that you can add, but you're going to be paying for uh, that in the sense that you get fewer missiles. It can get pretty crazy if you just turn this thing into a missile truck. 
Um, yeah, let's say this. I now have 12 air-to-air -air missiles and two short-range air-to-air missiles. So it's just a missile bus at this point. It can deal with enemy planes pretty efficiently. However, it is no Su-57. I'd say this is the ultimate hunter when it comes to dealing with planes. This is slightly less stealthy. The Su-57 has that stealth advantage. And with that, in the forward bay, let's say I want to have um, long-range missiles. And in the back, I want to have... Is the R-73? That's the... Yeah, that's against aircraft as well. 2,000 to 8,000 meters. 1,000 to 5,000. And uh, this is 500 to 2,000. So this can now engage uh, at any given range with a bunch of missiles. You can barely see them because they're between the... Let's say in the middle of the fuselage of the plane. TU-160. Final plane. Big guy at that. Bomb bay doors are open. We have either a lot of bombs, um, even more thermobaric bombs. We have a couple of 9,000 kilogram bombs, 1,500 kilogram laser guided bombs, cluster munitions, or cruise missiles. Oh, sorry, these are the standard cruise missiles. These are the cluster cruise missiles. Over here you get 12. Over here you also get 12. The range is 10,000 meters. Hello. Good luck trying to kill that with enemy interior. This is when those anti-ballistic missiles weapon systems are going to come in. I haven't tested this thing out yet, but I'm looking forward to it. So that's the units. Now, where does that leave us with the deck? The way that the devs have set it up, they got three different decks. The airdrop one focuses mostly on dropping things with helicopters, which is why this one has quite a lot of VDV. Some ingenuity in case you're dealing with specific infantry threats that you need gone. They can be brought in with the vehicles, but they don't strictly have to. Gvardi, if you want to have a more solid presence on the battlefield, because these are eight-man squads versus five. And you can drop all of these guys off with the helicopters just as much as with the vehicles that they come with. You can also say, I want to have the Gvardi get dropped off in uh, the Kurganets or the Boomerang. You have options that way. You can see that both, let's say, all the infantry can get airdropped. They have the drone for reconnaissance. Um, logistics is going to be important. Keeping those infantry units on the front line supplied is going to be key. Their firepower over here, I'd say, focuses around the armata with support from the arenas. The rest of the tanks are a bit more fire support, and I personally don't really agree with the coordinate because it might be too limited in its role. Yes, it's a great anti-tank platform, is it going to be enough? I'm not sure. It focuses a lot on interior, this particular platform, but does not use a whole lot of air power all by itself. You can see that it seems to focus quite a bit around the Su-57, dealing with anything that happens to fly. And for that purpose, it is set up with... Oh, sorry, no, it's not actually set up like that. This is set up as a seed aircraft. It only has anti-radiation missiles and a couple of self-defense short-range missiles. Then the Tu-160 comes in dealing bombing runs and this one comes in dropping off infantry not necessarily in that order a more balanced deck would be the ru balanced as it focuses a bit less around one specific play style so you don't have to everything uh, get dropped off it has pretty much the same recon tab if you look at the vehicles over here this one focuses much more around armor it does not carry a single HGM carrier. It also does not have the Sprut, so let's say the cheaper tank. It is just an Armata, it is a couple of arenas, um, an upscaled version of the T-80UM, and a BMPT Terminator. As for support, seeing as it has quite a few aircraft, you also want to be able to deal with enemy aircraft. It has a couple of books, some Tunguska, and some Strelas. Fire support for the vehicles is going to be provided by the T, uh, sorry, the T, uh, 2S35 with the extended range, so the HE wrap, and this one capable of dealing with infantry stuck in a building. Because you don't have that many infantry units, you got five of them, which I think could be a bit light. Helicopters, cargo, this one is set up to deal with anything, and the K52 is set up, well, pretty much also to deal with anything. But, hmm. 
I'm not so sure which one I would pick at the moment. And that's something I do want to have in most of my battle groups slash decks. I want to have a very quick, like, okay, this is the threat. This is what I need to bring in. If I'm going to have to go, eh, I'm not sure what to bring in, then I've not rate, made the right deck. So I would set the MI-35 up probably as a fire supporter for infantry. So more rocket pods, maybe some iglas, and that's it. And this becomes the tank killer. And they've set up their planes with a anti-radiation missile and air-to-air. So this fighter can potentially fly over the enemy lines and deal with enemy radar-guided threats and then engage planes. This is 25 set up to deal just as... <laughs> holy shit. As one big rocket plane. Rockets, rockets, rockets. And that's the S-25. Now, this means it only carries six of these. But that's a lot of damage. Suppressive power, 668. Infantry is going to have a very bad day. It has nothing on the wingtips. It has no optics. It's just just a rocket bus. SC-34, set up as an all-rounder. Cluster bombs, smart bombs, ECM pods, and anti-radiation. And the 30SM has pretty much nothing but longer-range air-to-air -air and some ECM pods. Alternatively, we have the Russian motorized. Now, this is not exactly a motorized deck in the sense that um, everything has wheels because you're still stuck with the limitations of the current specializations. There is no motorized specialization yet, but it has to do with vehicles that are bringing in the infantry. So you got more infantry. You got seven, let's say, base infantry. You got a couple of fire supporters. You got AGGM and interior. This, I'd say, is more suited if you're going into a town battle. This is the type of deck that you want around there. The BMPT Terminator 2 with the additional armor package and the grenade launchers can make a very nice companion for all of this infantry. The armada and the arenas can keep enemy tanks at bay. You got the book if you want to deal with enemy planes. Um, interestingly, not a whole lot of NTR here. So considering that I've got a Verba, a book and a Strela, I'm expecting some pretty serious air-to-air -air platform here. Yeah, the SU-57 is dealt as a fighter, purebred fighter. As for the rest, the vehicles that the infantry are coming in on, boomerang, 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 they're all the same. And with this up armored and the hefty punch from the 30 millimeter auto cannon, you can deal with most of the enemy vehicles, not armor, not tanks. You're gonna have to deal with those using the Cornets and that's the Cornet M that they have. You're gonna have to bring your own tanks to deal with their tanks and potentially something like Huh. Interesting. They haven't set up any plane to specifically deal with tanks. Not even this one. So where's their tank killing capability then? It's over here. The middle pylons and the K-52 carry 12 Vickers. And over here we got only four Atakas. I think this is a bit light on the anti-tank capability. I'm not sure if this would work. But hey, here's the trying. So, um, long video. I hope it helped you get started to an extent with how you can set up these decks, what units there are, how they can work together, what sort of synergy or combined arms approaches you can build. Let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments. I hope the video was useful. If it was, please give it a like so more people can find it. If you have any questions, I can try to answer those if you put it down below in the question sections, the comments. And other than that, have fun playing the beta. And I might see you out there on the battlefield.